Hey there, hope you're having a wonderful day. In this video, we're going to go over pointers to pointers. And this is sometimes referred to as a double pointer. And the word double pointer might be confusing because it might seem like we're referring to a pointer to a double. But a pointer to a pointer is simply a pointer that points to the memory address of another pointer. So here you can see I have a value, savings, and let's say I have 50,000 in my savings account. And I have a pointer to savings. So it's pointing to the address of savings. So I can print this out. So I'll print out the address of savings and the value stored at savings. And I'll print out the address of the pointer, the address stored at the pointer, and we dereference the pointer. So we're going to print out the value stored at the memory address that we're pointing to. So let's save and run the program. And as you can see, the variable savings is stored at this address and it has the value 50,000. And the savings pointer is stored at this address, which points to this memory address, which is savings. And at that address, we have 50,000. So a pointer points to a memory address, but we also need to store the pointers in a memory address. So for that reason, we can have pointers to pointers because pointers simply point to memory addresses. So to declare a pointer to a pointer, we have to declare the type of the pointer. So in this case, we have a pointer to an int. And we just add another asterisk or star indicating that this is a pointer to a pointer to an int. And for this demo, I'm just going to call this savings pointer pointer. And this is going to take the address of savings pointer. So this is read backwards. So savings pointer pointer is a pointer to a pointer of an integer. So I can print out the values like so. C out savings pointer pointer. And I can print out the memory address of savings pointer pointer, as well as the value of savings pointer pointer. So this should be the memory address of savings pointer. And if I dereference savings pointer pointer, we should get this value over here, which is the memory address of savings. So let's actually add space in between. And if I want to get the values of 50,000, well, I would have to do a double dereference. So I would do star star savings pointer pointer. So when we dereference the savings pointer pointer, we get the memory address of savings pointer, which is this. And then we can dereference this pointer so that we can get the value of savings. All right, so now let's save and run the program. And as you can see, we have the memory address of savings pointer pointer which points to the memory address of savings pointer. So it's equal to this value here. And if I dereference savings pointer pointer, then we get this value over here, which is equal to the memory address of savings. And then if we dereference it once more, we get 50,000, which is the value of savings, okay? And another thing you can do is you can have a pointer to a pointer to a pointer of an integer. And actually, you can add as many pointers as you want. But this would overcomplicate your code. And this is very unnecessary. The most you'll probably see is a double pointer. And that is because we use a pointer to dynamically allocate an array on the heap. But if we have a double pointer, then we can dynamically allocate a 2D array or a matrix on the heap. But aside from those use cases, I don't think there are many use cases for double pointers in C++. Now in C, there might be more use cases because there are no vectors or strings, and you cannot pass by reference in functions in C. But we'll go over functions and pass by reference in a later video. And speaking of pass by reference, so if I wanted a reference, I would do savings ref like so and just assign it savings. But what I cannot do is have a double reference. And this will not work because a reference is basically an alias. So if I do savings ref is equal to savings, then this value of savings ref is just savings. So there's no memory address that we need to assign to the savings reference. So if I do a reference of a reference, this wouldn't make sense because I would just be doing this. Okay. So yeah, we can have pointers to pointers, but there's no such thing as a reference to a reference. So why do we use pointers to pointers? Well, we can dynamically create 2D arrays on the heap. So for instance, if I have two variables, row count and column count, 
And in the previous video, we talked about allocating an array on the heap or dynamically creating an array. So if I wanted to create an array that is flexible in size or rather capacity, then I would have to do so on the heap. So here I want to ask the user to input a row count and column count. So let's see out. Enter two numbers for row count and column count. And then let's see in row count and column count. So if I were to declare a 2D array on the stack, I would do int table and let's make this a table of numbers. So I would try to do int row count and int column count. And you can see this does not work. When we allocate memory on the stack for an array, we need to specify the row count and column count ahead of time. So this cannot depend on some varying input. So you cannot do this. Instead, you'd have to do, for instance, table of five, five, like so, okay? So when you declare an array or a 2D array on the stack, you have to specify the number of rows and number of columns as a fixed number. So here we have five, five. This cannot change. So this is where a pointer to a pointer comes in because we can use that to dynamically create a 2D array on the heap. So what I can do is int star star table is equal to new int star. And here I can specify the row count. Now we cannot use the double bracket syntax like we do over here and do column count like so. This is not going to work. So what does this syntax mean? Well, a pointer just points to a memory address, right? So if I had one array on the heap, it would be like this. Let's call it row and this would be new int and let's say 10. So here we have an array of integers on the heap. But here we have an array of pointers to integers on the heap. So unlike with this array, this array is an array of memory addresses, whereas this array is an array of integers. So if I want to fill up this table, I would have to use a for loop. So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than column count, i plus plus. And then here I would do table of i is equal to new int column count. Okay, so we create an array of memory addresses and within each index of that array, we have a memory address of an array of integers. So now we have a 2D array, but in each row of this table, there are no values. So let's go fill in those values. So I can use a double for loop here, just like as if it were a 2D array created on the stack. So I can do for int i is equal to zero, i is less than row count, i plus plus for int j is equal to zero, j is less than column count, j plus plus. And sometimes instead of using i or j, when we're referring to the number of rows and columns, we might use r and c. But I'm just going to keep it consistent because I already used i here. But yeah, using r and c for row and column, is a lot easier to read than i and j because i and j look very similar. So it will definitely reduce the chance of you making a typo, which would cause an error in your code. But anyway, let's fill in these values. So I would do table of i, j, and assign it to zero. So this is just a default value I'm going to give here. And let's print out the values. So I can just copy and paste this. And instead of assigning it the value, we can just do C out table of i, j, space, and then after each row, we're going to see out end line. And let's do the same here. Okay, so here we are just filling the values with zeros and here we are printing out the 2D array. And before I run the program, we need to do a cleanup. So whenever we allocate memory on the heap, we need to clean up that memory if we're no longer using it. So let's do for int i is equal to zero, i is less than row count, i plus plus. We are going to free up the memory at that index of table, so delete brackets. So this is going to free up the memory of each array in the table. So I'm going to do table of i. And just to avoid dangling pointers, I would assign at each index no pointer. Okay. 
And after we've freed up the memory of each array within table, I'm going to free up the table itself. So delete table and let's set table to no pointer. So this should match the for loop we use for creating each row in the table array. So let's scroll up and check. And it seems like I made a typo. So this column count should actually be row count. So we create as many rows as there are row count. All right, let's save and run the program. All right, enter two numbers. Let's do five, five. And you can see we have five rows and five columns. And if we run the program again, let's do five, 10. And you can see we have five rows and we have 10 columns. All right, one more time, let's do 10, five. And you can see we have 10 rows and each row has five columns. So in one of my earlier videos, we talked about pointer arithmetic. So to change this to pointer arithmetic, we would have to start with table of i, which is the reference table plus i. And this gives us table at index i. And now if we want this at index j, we do the reference of this part, which is over here, plus j. And then let's assign it one. So if I save and run the program, and we do five, five, you can see we have five rows and five columns of ones. And if I run the program again, we can do four, eight, and you can see we have four rows of eight columns of ones. So when we declare a 2D array on a heap, we can use varying values. So they don't have to be fixed integers. And another benefit of doing this is we actually don't need to have the same number of columns in each row. So here, instead of doing column count, I'll just pass an I here, and I'll do the same over here and over here. So basically, instead of depending on what we input for a column count, I is going to be dependent on row count. So I starts at zero. So in the first iteration, we create an array of size zero, then one, then two, then three, and so on. So if I save and run the program, and I put in five, five, now we have an array of varying size, or rather capacity. So this first array can only hold zero values. This one holds one value. This one holds two, three, and four. So this is up to five. So we have five rows over here. And if I run the program again, we can do seven. And here we can do 3000, but this value wouldn't even matter because we only depend on the row count. So you can see we have seven rows and the column number depends on i, which goes from zero to six. So we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. All right. So just to recap with a 2D array on the heap, unlike with a 2D array on the stack, we don't need to use fixed integer sizes and each row does not necessarily have to have the same capacity. So you can have one row with 10 values and another with five and another with 20. It's up to you because here we are creating an array of memory addresses. And you might be wondering when we might ever use this. Well, if you were to ever make a game, for example, you can create a map of varying sizes. So if you ever played a game, you know that maps do not necessarily have to be the same size. So for instance, I can make a tile map here. So over here, I can do i is equal to zero or i is equal to one, then we assign it zero, else one, and let's save and run a program and see what this looks like. So I want to create a map of five, five, and you can see if i is equal to zero or i is equal to one, this means the first two rows, we assign it zero, otherwise we assign it one. And this is something we can use for creating maps in games. So this is known as a tile map because we can map each integer value with a tile. So for instance, I can say zero represents water and one represents land. All right, so that's how you can dynamically create a 2D array on the heap using pointers to pointers. All right, so that's it for this video. If you found this video helpful, make sure you give this video a like. And if you have any questions, let me know down below in the comments. And if you want to stay up to date for more C++ tutorials, make sure you subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.